I think the word disability is loaded with negative connotations for an awful lot of people, particularly those who acquire disability and who, for example, in the workplace, don't feel able to share with their employers that they are actually disabled. No one wants to make someone struggle on purpose. Uh, you know, and most people want to go out there and help people. They want to make sure that their teams and their colleagues are fully supported. Um, but, but this kind of fear of stigmatising and this fear of, of offending someone, this fear of, of labelling them potentially as well and, and, and of saying what they perceive as the wrong thing means that those conversations are never going to tackle the true the true um, sort of root of the problem, if there is one, and the true nature of what needs to be done to, to support that person. It is not my impairment, so it's not my medical condition, if you like, that, that disables me. It's the structures and behaviours and attitudes in society that create the barriers that stop me participating equally. Disablement is something that's done to people. If somewhere hasn't got a ramp or electric door, I'm disabled because I'm disabled from being able to use it, same as everybody else. So now I see disability as something that can be reduced or removed with others with understanding about what those barriers are. So I have a stammer, a speech impediment, um, which impacts my ability uh, to verbally communicate. The main, uh, the main barrier is it's kind of one size fits all approach where most colleagues and most uh, employees are expected to complete tasks and, and complete work in the same way. And that just simply doesn't work for people who, who are disabled. I was turned away never forget that I was turned away from uh, a building because I could not make myself understood. I was, to all intents and purposes, non-disabled. I'd just gone on with my life a bit differently. Then came the neurosurgery and I couldn't breathe. I was reliant on oxygen. I couldn't swallow uh, for about five months and I took about three years to learn to talk again. And the humiliation, the discrimination, made me realise that it was unavoidable. I was severely disabled. So I went back to college to reset my GCSE English because in my professional career, my written work has always held me back. But cut a long story short and a couple of tests, it transferred that I was dyslexic. And for me, that was such a light bulb moment. And then I kind of approached things very differently and quite creatively. So we had a problem we wanted to solve and I suggested, oh, let's use the whiteboard on Teams and we could work collaboratively. And I just got really pushed back down and said, no, we're using a spreadsheet and that's how we're using it. So the effect that had on me was I just shut down, checked out, didn't share my stories or my ideas or anything like that. What often um, kind of happens, and, I, and I've seen this quite a, a lot myself both personally and with, the, and with the apprentices that I work with, is that managers and employers end up putting into place what they think the person needs, not what they actually need. And what they think they need is generally a fairly kind of fixed one size fits all approach because that's the same approach that works on everyone else in the, in the employer. I've also had some quite negative experiences of individuals in organisations, um, my bosses, and I tend to think that at least one of them had an impairment themselves, and, but they tended to hide it. I think the fact that I was there openly disabled was quite challenging because it kind of reminded them of their own vulnerability if you like 
and that made them very uncomfortable and it meant that they lashed out at me and I had a very difficult time in that organisation. lack of understanding is, is again about um, making assumptions about disability that having a disabled people in your organisation is going to be expensive, um, could possibly they might have more time off sick um, than others, they might need more time for leave because of hospital appointments um, or it could be that they're going to be a health and safety risk and actually there's no truth in those <laughs> assumptions at all. Disabled people tend to work harder because they always feel that they have to prove something. 83% of people acquire a disability during their working life. So whilst you think your workforce is comprised of many people that don't present as disability, it's probably not true. There's probably a lot of people in your workforce that are struggling, are finding things difficult, but they might be too afraid to say. If we had cultures that were genuinely inclusive, where people felt able to say, I'm at my best when I do things this way, but in order to do that, I need this. Uh, and their managers were to listen and to provide that, the organisation enabled that supportive structure. I think it would make a massive difference. But importantly, it wouldn't just make a massive difference to disabled people, it would make a massive difference to the well-being of the organisation as a whole. I think one of the largest barriers really is around kind of a lack of awareness, lack of understanding. I think there's a lot of kind of stigma around disability, there's kind of misconceptions about what it means um, to have disabled colleagues within an organisation. I think that goes right through kind of the colleague life cycle. So I think looking at then the recruitment side, you have people thinking actually this person might need more support, they might need adjustments which are costly, or they might not actually be able to do the job in the way that we want them to do it, they might not have the necessary skills all of which I think are just myths around disability and the more that we can raise awareness and understanding of that through the process, uh, the more we can ensure that there is that inclusive environment for disabled colleagues. Without reasonable adjustments, many disabled people will not be in the position to give as much of themselves to their employer as they would like and hopefully, as the employer would like, a reasonable adjustment could be flexible working hours or it could be ensuring that someone who works remotely doesn't miss out on the opportunities that being in the office provides. Recently I've completed um, I have a second apprenticeship um, and uh, during that final assessment there was a presentation and, and an interview, um, which for me, a bit of a stammer, was obviously um, quite a, a nerve-wracking uh, prospect and something that was never going to be fully aligned with the way that I worked. Um, so therefore, um, for that assessment, I received adjustments in the form of, of additional time, um, of the option to have uh, rest breaks and also to meet my assessor informally beforehand. And that meant that I, that, that I was therefore able to work in the way that was best aligned uh, to my strengths and ways of working and therefore pass the apprenticeship. Reasonable adjustments are really important to our colleagues. We want them to be able to come into work each day, to be set up for success, to have what they need to enable them to do their job um, as effectively uh, as they're able to. It makes really good business sense for us. We know that a lot of um, colleagues, as research shows, will leave an organisation if it isn't set up with the adjustments that they need. So for us, we want to retain the talent that we have. We have some great disabled colleagues within the organisation. And so if by providing them with some adjustments that they need will allow them to stay at the organisation to thrive at Tesco. It's absolutely a no-brainer in that we should be providing it for them. I 
Aphasia is extremely important in, in all aspects of inclusion and supporting our disabilities. If you, if you don't know something, then you can't support it. If you don't know that someone is disabled, if you don't know how someone works, then you can't support them because your because um, a, a your work becomes a case of guessing. It becomes a, t a case of making choices that are uninformed. Um, so in that aspect, the more data and the more the more knowledge that you have, the the better and the stronger your ability is to support um, someone who might need that support. If you don't have data, you don't have the information. If you don't have the information, you don't know where you need to go and take some positive action. So data is really important. It tells you the landscape of your organisation. Data is crucial to assessing how business performs. So why wouldn't you apply it to all areas of your business, including EDI? Otherwise, you are simply working in the dark. Um, would you really apply the same approach to your business performance in terms of building your client base, improving your, your profit margins. I think the answer would be if you did, you wouldn't be in business for long. I think one employer can do to attract and retain more diverse talent is to make sure that um, in their attraction strategies they involve a diverse range of people in developing that strategy. Again it comes back to talking to your workforce um, and getting their input into it. It's about the imagery you use, it's about the language you use and it's about reaching out to these different areas of the community to make sure that you're attracting from the widest pool of talent. There are advantages to an organisation being more inclusive that are about better decision making, greater productivity. If you do it so that people are doing their best work because they can have modifications made to jobs or environment or whatever that enables them to do their best work, um, then, then yes, there will be positive performance impacts on the business. And there is some research that indicates that it, there is a positive impact on the bottom line from being more inclusive. We have a generation that are coming up and, and even active now that ethics are really important to them and they want to make sure that that organisation is walking the talk so it's not just a tick box exercise. Yes, we have a diverse range of people working. You need a diverse range of people working in your workplace because then you get diverse ideas, creativity, innovation, you get lived experiences that will help you and give you informed decisions as well. Having a disability inclusive environment at Tesco has so many different benefits. I think from an individual perspective it allows our colleagues who do have disabilities to feel like they can bring them their whole selves to work really to talk about their disability to be as open as they would like to and feel supported by their managers and the rest of the organization I think from a team perspective having that diversity of thought so having people of all different um, different backgrounds uh, different abilities and um, uh, all different protected characteristics just adds to what we can bring to our customers uh, further down the line if we have a diverse team making decisions for what is a very 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 diverse customer base that we serve, we will ultimately be able to serve our customers that bit better every day. If you are looking uh, to raise awareness, uh, especially firstly if you are disabled, um, being willing to speak out about your experiences and to educate people, as I say, knowledge is power and the more that people know, the more they can incorporate accessibility and inclusion into, into what it is that, that, uh, that they're doing. So being willing to speak out and, uh, and being willing to share your experiences is hugely valuable. If you aren't disabled, then I think being being willing to listen um, to people's experiences um, is hugely important. Um, and making sure that you aren't putting up barriers and, and making sure that you're able to have open and honest conversations.
within the business. We've heard some really great individual stories of colleagues who've reached out to us to say that because of what they've read um, with, from their, their colleague network or because of the discussion they've had with their manager, they feel that they're able to share their lived experience more generally. There's been quite a lot around mental health as well, um, particularly men um, speaking up around their mental health within their stores, um, sharing their experiences of where they have struggled and the support that they have received. Um, we've also seen some really brilliant stories um, within our, our stores, things like a manager learning sign language to best support their deaf colleague. If you know disabled people in your workplace but and you, you, you think it might be useful to be able to help them in some way but you don't know how, then ask. I used to belong to an organisation, used to work with an organisation um, where one of the, the sayings was, if you can't do the small talk, how can you do the big talk? So just talking to disabled people is really important. Think about disability in a positive way. You know, for me, I grew up not thinking I was going to finish my education, that I wasn't going to have any employment opportunities, and now I head up disability advocacy in a large organisation. So who knows what the future can, can hold and it's about giving people opportunity. I think if I, if I could go back to earlier in my career I would try and use the power of my voice as an ally more than I did. I think it's easy to look back in, in hindsight but as somebody who was kind of new in career and, and face with people who'd been in an organisation a lot longer, um, it's easy to feel like your voice isn't valued or you can't stand up and, and challenge in a way that you ought to. I think there's much more awareness now of what it means to be an ally. The one key message that I'd like the viewer to take away from this documentary is that change can happen. Change has happened in ways that my generation could never have anticipated. For example, uh, on a whole range of protected characteristics, whether that's ethnicity, whether it's um, gender, whether it's sexual orientation. Your Trust, we have the Disability Power 100, which is an initiative that profiles the most influential disabled people in the UK and that represents all sectors. But what's great about the Power 100 is it's people that have reached the top of the game. You know, they might be executives, they might be disability specialists, they could be anything. But second to that is they have a disability. But because of what they've done in their jobs, um, they've made a difference for others. And that's what we focus on. I mean, I've got a, a, a great quote, you know, it's like, it's great, we've invited you to our party, but we want to make sure we create um, a place that you feel that you can dance. But if you don't feel comfortable in that environment, then you're not going to dance, are you? You're going to stay at the side, hold your drink, be by the buffet table. And if you want to do that, that's fine. But actually, what's the point of putting the party on if nobody wants to dance? Mm -hmm.